hello, 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 everyone. I'm super excited to have you on the show again. Bautista, you're looking good as always. Um, we're going to have too. a fantastic guest today who has been basically creating the biotech startup ecosystem in Latin America from scratch. When we look a little bit over 10 years ago, what was the situation when, when our guest tried to start investing in deep tech companies in Latin America, he realized that there was not that many companies where you can invest in. The current reality at that, at that time was that you had over 200,000 researchers basically working in academy, academia, but they were not really making spin-offs from their research and starting companies. So this guest had to do something about it. So about this, who do we have in the show and what has happened um, with his journey? Yeah, we're going to have Matias Bayden. He's the founder of Gridex, or also called Grid Exponential. They have 66 companies in their portfolio today. And as you mentioned, over 10 years ago, there was almost no startups in the biotech vertical, and they started to be the main investor in this. Yeah. So and it's super exciting that you have him on the show and he is now running together with his team, the second fund. Um, so some crazy people have been putting money into, into their funds, uh, which is pretty impressive when you're taking this new approach and new model where they're basically connecting researchers into business people through their program. So the founders of these new companies not have, not always have met each other. And now through this program called Grid Exponential, they're going to meet their founding uh, members of the team is like getting in fast forward and a fast lane towards marriage. This is what is happening. This is what Matthias and Grid Expo have been building with the very promising results already. So without further ado, let's, let's welcome Matthias to the show. Welcome to the Find the Way podcast. In this show, we will try to explore what is happening in emerging markets and how entrepreneurs, investors, and communities are simply finding the way to make phenomenal things happen, regardless how volatile the environment may sometimes seem. So, Matthias, it's great to, great to have you on board in the show today where, where you have been really building up the scene of biotech in, in Latin America, all the way from North of Mexico down to Ushuaia, pretty much. And, and, and um, I think that what you told me when we met is that why you started with Grid Exponential and you started getting into the game and into the scene in this industry is that you saw the huge need, the talent, the capabilities of Latin America, but you did not see enough companies where you would be able to start investing. Thus came the new idea, the concept, the model that you created with your teammates at Great Exponential is to put together scientists and business people through your programs so you can push them out with the world that our star, you know, have been starting to solve global problems from day one. Uh, can you share a little bit of, of what was that? How did that get started? I think that is a pretty fascinating story and I think that would be a great starting point. Great. Eric and Motita, thanks for the invitation. I'm excited to be here. And yes, that's correct. I started like um, almost 10 years ago trying to see how to invest in the in science-based startups in the region. Uh, not biotech at that, at that moment. It was science in general. And it happens that uh, there were no startups to invest in. You know? So after a year of understanding the ecosystem and in, in all the region, understanding the opportunities for for these kind of investments in the in the region, and the conclusion was that okay, why the VCs were not investing in, in these kind of startups? Well, because there were no startups to invest in. So at that point, the there was like a was like a crossroad you know, to say, okay, what should we do? Should we do something with this uh, or we have to move to another sector where we can invest with, with better approaches? And, and the decision uh, was to do something because there were a lot of very talented scientists. Uh, even though there was a, an open question from investors, like more local investors, regional investors, saying, why these scientists uh, are going to be competitive in the world with their science when you have uh, the same infrastructure, the same 
like grants for for basic science. But w what we saw at that moment was that there were other like uh, very good publications in very high profile uh, uh, journals. You now in specific sectors, there were there were a lot of scientists that did their PhDs or post PhDs or some exchanges with uh, universities of research uh, institutes from all around the world. So there were like evidence about the, the the real potential of these scientists in the region that could be competitive. And on the other hand, we had a lot of scientists. We estimated that that in life sciences, two hundred thousand researchers in the region, in whole Latin America. Of, yeah, from Mexico okay. to Argentina. Yeah. yeah, and none of them were outside the academia. So in terms of availability or or the, of scientists creating their own their own their own startups, the 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 numbers makes no sense, no, because even that you didn't have a tradition in creating companies, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you didn't have like uh, scientists becoming entrepreneurs. If you saw the amount of, of scientists, at least some kind of of rate about that that amount should be transforming into into startup. So, so it, at the moment, there were no startups coming out. And, and and what do you mean by that moment? What year? What year was that exactly? Can you clarify that? What, Yes, I started, I like uh, came out from my former company in 2013, the middle of 2013. So I started thinking about, and in 2014, I finally uh, like clarify my, my three years uh, uh, plan to, to do this like exploration process and understanding process and design process for for, for finding something to connect science and, and venture capital. So it was uh, at the beginning of, of 2014 that with this idea, I started the process of first research, then design, and then execution. And then came biotech. You transferred that, you, it, the exploration journey started with all science, you know, you vast amount, you mentioned 200,000 scientists in the region. And but not nothing was really transforming into private companies out of there. And comparing to let's say Europe, uh, Central Europe, Northern Europe, the U.S., where you have a lot of um, universities, research institutes that are basically spinning up a lot of that research into companies and putting that into the you know markets. Um, that has not been happening in Latin America, as you basically stated. And but how did you transfer then into biotech? What was that? What happened there? Well, great question. It, it was a process. That uh, it, it was like a very natural process because as we get uh, deep in the understanding of how to create companies coming out from science, uh, the most advanced e ecosystem related to venture capital uh, was the biotech pharmaceutical ecosystem in the in this area. And when I when I was seeing that, and when I was seeing the the opportunities of scientists in Latin America, thinking about being competitive in bio pharma was there very difficult. There was a huge difference between the the the, the investments that the U.S. in in, in uh, uh, mainly you no know, does in 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 basic science in in cancer, for example, or or, or other diseases. And it was very difficult to be competitive. But uh, in 2014, 15, uh, mm -hmm. I started uh, seeing uh, the, the an emerging ecosystem of new biotech companies pushed by the advances in three technological like uh, building blocks. Mm -hmm. One was the uh, the the sequencing, genome sequencing, no, this is the process to digitize the DNA, no, the genetical information. Uh, that in, in 2000 cost like, like 100 million to, to synthesize, to, 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 sorry, sequence uh, uh, the, whole, the whole human DNA. Uh, today you can sequence all the 
human DNA for $1,000 or less. Yeah. So that was an exponential difference of cost and more accessibility. Uh, the other technology uh, that was like improving and growing very fast was the, the, the like uh, genome editing tools like such as CRISPR. Mm -hmm. So more accessible, more easy, more cheaper. Uh, you don't need any more like a million or several million dollars uh, lab to do that kind of, of, of procedures. And the third one, the like building block technology uh, that was right out was like the interfaces between between the like biological world and the digital world. And and there you can have like microfluidics, uh, optics, uh, microelectronics, biosensors, and, and and different technologies that were speeding up the process. Of so with that scenario, uh, the possibilities to create solutions in the uh, in agriculture, in food, in diagnostics, in personal medicine, in biomaterials or industrial biotech stuff was starting to 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 give uh, like a, a, a growing process of new startups. And at that point, in between 2014 and 15, uh, they started in the bio, no, in the yeah. in the US. No? So uh, that was a different accelerator for this kind of startup that there were no like pharmaceutical startups like it was had been created for the last 20 years at, the, at, the, at that point in Boston mainly. No? Uh, so it was a new approach and I started see, seeing there the kind of the startup that uh, of the kind of scientists creating startups that uh, that I saw in the region. No? So they are saying, okay, yeah. Here in this specific niche, you know, we can be very competitive. That was the main reason to start focusing on biotech, but was two more reasons. The second one was that uh, the critic mass of scientists uh, in Argentina mainly, but in the region in general, uh, was related to, to, to life science in general you know, with a wide scope of what, what, what we are talking about when we talk mm -hmm. about life sciences. Uh, in Argentina, it's 65% of scientists are related to life sciences in general. And we think that there's not like, like, uh, like uh, reliable data about that, but we estimate that in the rest of the region is something is, 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 is the same between 60 percent of scientists are related to, to biotech. That is 200,000 researchers related to life sciences in the region. So the second was the critical mass of science related to, to, to life sciences. And the third was that there was a, a, a tradition of biotech in Argentina, uh, specifically. Uh, we have three Nobel prizes in, in, in science in Argentina. That's very uh, unusual now for a, for a country of the size and the importance like Argentina is. Uh, so it's a huge tradition. And we have a, like a emerging industry, not developing like uh, frontier technologies, but using knowledge, uh, scientific knowledge to develop vaccines for humans, for animals, new uh, uh, crops, uh, doing biofuels, uh, doing food. So uh, many like uh, medium and, and big companies doing that kind of stuff. So there were candidates there to 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 have the first investors for 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 this idea, so that yeah. three uh, uh, reasons uh, like put us in the path of bio. Okay, and and what has been it, even before that? Let's say when you start exploring the world of biotech almost ten years ago, um, you mentioned that you have a very strong legacy of life sciences and that research over there, three Nobel prizes um, in Argentina. So there's there is and there has been relatively great momentum in it. What might be the reason that there has not been any bigger corporations that are, are coming out of Latin America that at least, you know, growing up in Europe and working over there or in the U.S., typically Latin America doesn't come into, into mind when you think about biotech. It's U.S. takes the majority of, of, of big companies, the majority of funding, then very known places are, you know, when you go to China, you go to South Korea, you have Sweden, Finland, Germany, the Netherlands. But what is... 
what is going on that Latin America has been basically not on the lips of people when they talk about or think about biotech? No, first is that historically there were no like um, like R and D investments in science or uh, in 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 the private sector in the region. No? Like lo no. local companies didn't do like R and D. These biotech companies, uh, they uh, they they was not doing uh, like frontiers technologies. No, they were doing like some processes uh, to produce to more more focus in in your regional markets that kind of stuff. That is difficult to be competitive to become a leader company uh, for the world. So I think the main reason the main reason is that uh, there, there, there is not a a culture of in general not not only in 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 life science in not only in biotech but in general you don't have like innovative companies coming out from from Latin America in general doing techn um, developing technologies no you have a several technological companies that focus on the regional markets such as Libre, Govant and 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 Nubank and that kind of companies that are very important companies now that very uh, fast growing companies are now great examples for, for for entrepreneurs, but we don't have companies in the region that they are bringing new technologies to the world uh, are competing from Latin America to the world. So there is a lack of that kind of culture in the region. And what do you think that is, Matthias? Is it only because of a lack of investments or is there something else that is lacking in the, in the whole ecosystem? No, I think it's, it's the, the whole chain in the ecosystem uh, to really start a process of inspiring new, new, new scientists and new entrepreneurs and start uh, showing the investors the, the opportunities that uh, we have in the region to invest in this kind of talent and start creating. We have some examples like heroes in, in the region, like Satellogic. There is a, a, a company led by Emiliano Carrion and that is, he, it was the, the first company in the world uh, of, of proposing this like a constellation of, of small satellites, no? Yeah. Um, others companies like uh, uh, come up and, and were faster because of these kind of ecosystems. But Emiliano was a really leader in the uh, for all the deep tech industry in, in the region. But it's just starting this process of uh, having these kind of companies in the region. No, so I think we are living in a world that that, that the knowledge is flat. So today is uh, is is easier to create a company in the frontiers of technologies coming out from other places rather than, than the U.S. Yeah, and in terms of that, so given the global nature of biotech, you clearly believe there is like a unique advantage as well from Latin America because you're competing globally. So what do you think that is? What do you think is the unique thing that Latin American scientists or companies from biotech can excel at compared to everyone else? Yes, I, I think we have great advantages for 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 the early stage no? of this uh, of these companies no then we have to see process we are we are too early yet no to 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 really see advantages in the in the latest stages but in the early stages we have huge advantages one uh, is that you what, what i mentioned that almost all the scientists in the region are working at the academia. So if you become a startup, you have, we, we used to say there is an, an like talent arbitrage opportunity, no? So uh -huh. uh, you don't have to compete with a Genentech or, or with a hundred million dollar funded startup that is hiring PhDs, no? Uh, to keep the best talent for your startup, no? So, the, the the talent is is there, and we our our ambition is to have at least of those two hundred thousand researchers in life sciences is to have like twenty thousand researchers working in startups 
in the next 10 years in the, in the region. No? That could be like a, a huge impact no? and, and, and could be very, very new. I think that the first one is, 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 is that like talent arbitrage opportunity. And the, the second one is that there is a cost arbitrage opportunity. A PhD in the region could cost like a 10 of what it costs in the US and in Europe. And also that is very important for the first couple of uh, dozens, millions of dollars that you are putting into a startup to try to expand the frontiers of knowledge. Oh, well, that's for sure. That's for sure. Because let's say only yesterday I heard about a um, company pitching here in, in Florida about a company that wanted to have between five and 10 million immediately out of the gate, basically only with a presentation to build up their first facility. Um, and comparing that to some of the startups that Grid Exponential has been introducing us to is, 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 is crazy to hear the differences in number one, the requirements of cash that they need to be able to get testing facility number two, expansion of lab number two, uh, building that physical infrastructure. And, and, and from there is like, when you look beyond that, when you look at the op- OPEX, it's, it's crazy. The comparisons, it's, it's like with the one person salary in, in the U.S., um, you, you have a full team operating and you've been building hardware infrastructure to support your experiments and, and testing your hypothesis. It's crazy. People, yeah, totally. people don't know. But then it's a very fascinating point that what you mentioned now here, that the first point is that the talent arbitrage is that a lot of folks, when you go to the US or you go to Europe, for the further you go basically from your home and we take Chile, Argentina, Colombia, they are not only culturally distant, but they can be old. Like they're geographically super far away. And the people, we are group animals. We start thinking about what do we all know? It's going to be scary. It's going to be confusing. So it's like very interesting that you mentioned the talent arbitrage over there because a lot of folks think that, in, that the talent is not as capable. So that's yeah. why it's like you, the companies in the US or you go to, to Sweden, you go to Finland, you go to the Netherlands. The companies are raising so much more money, number one, because they need to. Otherwise, they cannot maintain their operations. They cannot prove their hypothesis. And But when now global investors are looking at Latin America, I think that you also have a lot of work to be done in terms of explaining the talent arbitrage because people don't believe. First of all, it's going to be too you know, cheap cost of labor. They think that they must be bad in what they do. So I don't like, can you also like elaborate a little bit on that before we even go to your third point that you were mentioning why Latin America is that, why do you say that the talent is great? Are there universities? Like when, before me entering the world of Latin America and really going through the region from Mexico down all the way to almost to Tierra del Fuego in Argentina, I have never heard about the universities. Nobody's ever mentioned to me about those. There are very, you know, a lot of people who are saying this and this school is great. They went to the best schools. I've never heard about them. Because in the rankings, the global ranks, we never see them. So is the talent really good? Like, are the, are the universities so great? The research, they're great. Why are you, where is this coming from? This number one point of yours, that there's talent arbitrage. No, that's, that's a very good point. And, 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 and it's a very challenging point to, to, to be confident with investors. Uh, we always, we always say that, uh, Pitches and proposals from our startups and defenses of what they are doing have to be uh, 10x better than the, the general uh, people. Because if you have like a Harvard bucket uh, a startup uh, competing with a like UBA or Conicet startup, uh, University of Buenos Aires, by the way, for the audience, is UBA. Yeah. Yes. And Connie said it's like the, the Council of Science and Technology in, in Argentina that is very prestigious, but, but there's no investors that really know what Connie said means. No? So it's, it's very challenging. <clears throat> but I think that slowly we are doing. No? So today is a, a more easy to a startup coming out from a portfolio to go to San Francisco and to say, where you come from? I'm from Argentina. Oh. And where is Argentina? <laughs> you maybe even yeah. don't know where, where it is. But instead of only talking about that they're coming from Argentina, say, okay, no, we, I come from the, the same place that a company like STEM or like B-Flow or like Congo Precision or Kenny Crop uh, or like Puna Bio 
I said, oh, okay, I know those guys. Yes, yes. And I talked to the scientists. And, uh, and, it, and, and they're really, really cool. And, and they're really good scientists. And, and I've been looking for the work and, and the papers, not only the, the, the commercial uh, work, also the scientific. Uh, that I did a due diligence, or a friend of mine did a due diligence on that. And, yeah. and, uh, and I see that this is, this is good stuff. You know? So this is competitive mm. stuff. So we have some like more objective uh, arguments to, to use. Like TVT, like your journals were publishing before for the start of the, the, the yep. process of two great companies. But those, when when you at the end of the day put that this conversation of comparing like Harvard, Stanford, Davis, or Berkeley, or you name which university against those, even that you have like a like a uh, like concrete information that should give the the evidence that they have to be good, no, because they have these uh, scientific careers. Uh, the, the the more strong evidence or, or or process to create the confidence is the, the examples that they are seeing of companies coming up from particular region in this yeah. case, but but it's going to be for the for the rest of the region in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And then you basically would you know sorry I interrupted you over there. You were mentioning the third point to both these test questions on on on. Number one was talent. Number two was a cost arbitrage. And now the third point that you were trying to make. Yes. And the th third point is, is very particular because it's the, the biodiversity that we have here in the, uh, in the region. Yeah. Uh, Latin America is the most biodiverse region in the world. And why is this important in this new scenario of biotech companies that uh, are data-driven companies, this kind of companies? It's not only... Uh, about biology, it's also about the data that you can have. So, in general, you see the biodiversity and the forest, and that you have to maintain biodiversity because a matter of sustainability and yeah. ecosystem balance. And that's, of course, it's true and, and it's very important. But as we are transforming biology into digital, there is a lot of information in that biodiversity that could really impact the world in significant ways. Uh, there's a lot of evolution over there of microorganisms and plants in animals that can really have solutions for health, for uh, food, for agriculture, and, and much more stuff, uh, thinking about understanding the, that biodiversity, uh, I think is a huge asset that the region has today. Uh, absolutely. And isn't that, that might be turning into your advantage to the folks living in, in, in Latin America have just an easier and faster access to all of the mysteries of, for instance, the Amazonia that we don't even know what's there. Isn't that what the predictions are that we don't, we don't really yeah. know what can be done by getting out of our, our nature. Um, totally. Yes. There is a, an expectation that there are a lot of solutions coming out from 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 that nature that we really don't know. You know that that I, I don't have very well the the numbers, but just to 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 make an example, no, I think it's something like the seventy or eighty percent of the the, uh, the drugs available in the world came out from uh, from nature. Yeah. Mimicking nature, our molecules that we are imi trying to imitate from nature. No, your grandmother, like, like you make with a, with a grass, something, and the curio, the, the flu or something. So they see which kind of molecules were in that kind of grass and they do something about that. So something like 70% of the, 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 the drugs come, all the work coming out from the, from, from nature. And we explore something like the 10% of nature. We know, and we are we mapped something about like ten percent of the biodiversity of the world. So imagine yeah. what could happen with that ninety percent that we really didn't map. And it's not only that the 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 the, the percentage of of nature and biodiversity that we didn't map is the uh, speed of mapping and the the, the 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 capabilities that now we have as we digitize biology, the speed of yeah of understanding combinations and possibilities of that, that biology 
is a huge opportunity and that information there is a huge asset. And these three points that you mentioned, talent, cost, biodiversity, and I think it's fantastic for the audience to understand it's that Latin America is the most biodiverse region in the whole world. It's a very important point to understand. Is these three topics where you've been able to, for instance, as a great exponential, uh, to build a very or relatively strong relationship with IndieBio, um, one of the most important accelerators in, in, in the U.S. when it comes to biotech and deep tech companies. Uh, would you be able to also like, what has been happening there? You, you mentioned that a lot of your uh, portfolio companies, so your model goes into that you are doing the matchmaking of the scientists and the business ops people. You put 200K tickets for those people to go through your programs. By the way, how long does it last, the program that you're making? It's six months. We have a first stage of three months where they match and another three months where we worked with the, with the funding team, the new funding team. Is this all the engagement you do with them? Is it this six month period and then you just stay back and let them do the rest or how does it work after the first well, initial contact? As we, as we have like uh, find it, uh, resources, no. So uh, we have to focus uh, on something. Uh, our eighty percent of our focus in, is in that process. Then we try to help them to connect with the the next stage. There is going abroad and connecting with uh, with the uh, investors, working with you to 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 help him all the portfolio to to connect with the with with the new investors or companies. Uh, that can work. We we do we do a lot of that, uh, but we are not involved as we are in the first six, six months with all the portfolio. Mm -hmm. So yeah. so our deepest work is to do uh, very good and and every year trying to do it better. The selection process and the transformation process. As we mm -hmm. don't work with a startup, we work with a scientist and entrepreneurs that have. It, maybe maybe they 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 don't have even an idea. They just have a couple of ideas. No, who are those, and how we transform that into a, a investable startup is our main uh, focus today. But we try to do this type of connections, and Indivio is a very good uh, example because we've been like working with them for the last six years. Uh, and and going deep in this in that relationship and, and for us it's very important because it's it's the best way to get in the U.S. and to get in the uh, the the venture capital investors in the U.S. And how did that relationship start with IndieBio? Is like you, you you picked up the phone and gave gave a call fifty five times and and tried to <laughs> pinpoint those three things: talent, cost, and biodiversity. You need to talk with us, or what, what, like how how the heck did it start? You know, it's like. That's a good point. Uh, no, as as everything happened uh, at Gridex, all was organic. You know, uh, we we just started walking, thinking that we should do this because it was a huge opportunity, and the model was uh, changing and transforming as the way we walk. So first we said we have to invest in this. There were no startups to invest in. We have to work with scientists to help them transform themselves into entrepreneurs. But you can go at as the speed you need to go if you don't put an entrepreneur, a business entrepreneur, because the learning curve, curve for a scientist in Latin America is going to take like three or five years until they are really prepared to become entrepreneurs and face the venture capital industry. And then, well, but if you have the startups, there are no investors in the region. So what do we have to do? We have to connect them with the investors abroad. So because I'm not but I was looking for this kind of startup, uh, this kind of, of, of investors. In 2014, uh, Indivio was uh, like uh, starting the process for the, the first badge. I already was working in the idea of, of Gridex. Uh, some some person that was working at, at Indivio came to, to Buenos Aires as, for vacations and he connected with the biohacking community. And I was there. I'm not a, a scientist, and, but I was at the biohacking community talking with, like, we, we were like 20 persons, crazy persons talking about biohacking. 
and I don't know why he connected uh, with the community and we organized like a, an event for 20 persons and he uh, uh, told us about in the bio and the first cohort that they were looking for. So I, I keep in contact with, with him. Uh, the other, I went to San Francisco and uh, I contacted him. He said, okay, I'm, I, I, I left in the bio. I'm not working anymore. They, they are just starting, but uh, look at today or to, uh, this this evening they are doing like a a meetup over there. So knock the door and get in. So uh, I did it. I knocked the door. I didn't. I called them. Oh, so it's I did it. Better, like you're going a pre phone time. You just knock on the door. I love it. You know they can decline you when you're there at the door. It, it, exactly. It's too rough. Exactly. <laughs> I use that a lot by myself as well. Like people feel bad to turn you down if you're on the door. You know. Yeah, totally. So I, I met the, uh, Ryan Bettigrew, that was one of the founders of, of, in 2015 uh, of, of Indivayo. And, and their fathers were from Cuba. And so I, I, I told him that I was from Latin America. And I, say, I started saying, okay, we have these three advantages. We didn't have any, any, any startup yet on the performance. You know? So what all promises? I said, okay, let's talk. And we start talking with him. And in, at the end of 2017, when we raised our first fund and we invested in the first companies, uh, our one company first applied to to Indivayo, uh, and finally we had the, the first company. Between that, in 2016, we invited Ryan Betten to to Argentina for for a the Chamber of Biotechnology organized an event, and they invited him, uh, introduced by me, you know, to to be the, the keynote speaker. So. So we also start, started doing a, a, like that process of, of getting closer and then showing what was happening here. So from there, from 2018, every year we have one or two or three companies uh, from, from our portfolio uh, in, the, in the different uh, cohorts of Indivayo in San Francisco or, or New York. And in 2019, we invited um, Arvind Gupta that was the other founder of uh, Indivayo, and he was the the GP at Indivayo. Uh, also for a chamber of biotechnology in Argentina event, he was a keynote speaker. Uh, and at that point, there, there were already four startups from Portfolio Indivayo, and he was saying, okay, one could be possible that coming out from anywhere. Two, also coincidence. Three, okay, what's happening here? But four companies, yeah. what? What was it? So he wanted when he might say, "Okay, yeah, yes, I want to go because I want to see what is going there. Why is going on? so many companies coming out from from Argentina?" No, so so we started that process, and and and, and, and today is very important. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had here in in Buenos Aires at Sean O'Sullivan, that is the founder of SOSB, that is the I fund am. that were in the bio of Hacks and Orbit um, uh, below. Uh, and and it was the first time he was he was here, and, and we introduced all the ecosystem, all all, all the companies from the portfolio, and we have a, a great weekend with him, uh, talking about stuff and, and, and looking for for further collaborations. Nice. Well, in that case, you know, he said, "Well, you gotta give us give us his number or even better home address, so we can knock on his door wherever he lives and invite him to the show as well." You know, it's uh, that that is my ideas. We're gonna keep you on that. That's a great thing that you want, what you mentioned right now. Um, but then, okay, so, but now if we take a little bit of a look on your portfolio as well, you have over 50 companies. How, what is the number today? Yes, you today we were uh, running our seven uh, cohort uh, batch and, and, and there are 10 new companies. So we are now 66 companies at the portfolio. Look at that. And so you're truly building the biotech scene of Latin America. Starting from nothing in 2014, you look into the experiments. Everybody was working in their labs in, in, in research universities. And now Matias Pere along his team comes into play. And then there's 66 companies now in the portfolio. That's pretty awesome. By the way, I got to, you know, it's, it's fantastic work that you've been doing. No doubt about that. But now it comes into, okay, who has been that crazy, literally crazy, that they put money <laughs> into your idea? Who has been crazy, stupid, 
couriers, whatever you want to call those people, who has been putting money on you? So who are your limited partners if you're able yeah. to share at least a little bit? And where are they from? I'm very interested. <laughs> are they from the region? Are they from Europe, the US, Asia? Where are they coming from? No, no, they, they are from Argentina. Mm -hmm. uh, All of them? The, the, the initial, the initial crazy one. Yeah. So, and today, how does that look? Is it still mostly Argentinian? Sorry. Yes, yes, it's mostly Argentina. We have the IDB also. Uh, some investors from the US and Mexico too, but mostly we are still mostly from, from Argentina. No? And but what was the big fund size? Uh, sorry to interrupt, but what was the, the fund to, size? Today, the fund size that we are running right now, this is our second fund, is $30 million. $30 million. Yeah, so it's, it's and still small. Matthias, so you, you mentioned you had 66, around 66 companies in the portfolio, but biotech is a very, very wide term. Are you guys looking for something a bit more specific? Is it just overall biotech in Latin America, what you're trying to? That's a good question because it's, it's something that we we also uh, do because it's it's organic also uh, the 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 challenge for our process is to transform that scientific project into like a very strong founding team and a, a founding team with a, some hypothetical proposal that could be attractive for investors for us as we explore all the scientific ecosystem focused on biotech, sometimes it's, it's the same to do that job, rather is diagnostics, agriculture, food, or biomaterial. No? So it makes no sense yet to focus in one vertical. So we are talking about technology, about biotech, but the problems that we are facing at, the, at that pretty early stage are pretty the same in a like deep, a pharma tool. We are not going to develop a, a new molecule company, no, but a pharma mm -hmm. tool rather than a company that does something for a biopesticide. For example, no? So the challenges yeah. are very, very similar at that stage. So we are not focusing and we have companies in culture and food, in environment, uh, tools, and, and health and the industry. Yeah. And, and I have two, two more questions here. Is it so? One is, are these scientific projects, are all these new ideas, or are you guys also replicating things that are happening elsewhere in the world? And then on the vertical side, do you think that, well, you mentioned Argentina is particularly interested in life sciences, but are, are we particularly good at something, at some vertical that we could excel at compared to anywhere else in the world? Well, the first question is that the process demands that you have like original stuff no mm -hmm. as as this solution have to be very niche oriented uh, and so because of that the world is is the market you need to bring something new to the table because you're 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 gonna be, you're, you're not gonna be like a latin america startup you have to be like a worldwide startup and you, you're gonna compete uh with startups coming out from all around the world. So you have to find the right spot to find your differentiation. Maybe you, you can go, you can, you can be in like, like similar uh, places than other startups, but in general it's not to copy something is to find like your original approach to maybe the same stuff because you, we have more, but as, as a more original is a startup, more competitive uh, is going to be you know? so most of the companies really are the two, three, or four companies competing in that specific niche in the world. Uh, so there are not so many companies. We do not have like 100 companies or thousands of companies uh, that you can really say, okay, this is a very similar company of what you have in your, in your portfolio. Now, maybe 90% of our portfolio really are competing with three, four, or five companies all around the world. No? So... So, so that is, uh, that is uh, very important. Uh, and, and, and I think there, we, we didn't find yet like some, some, it should be something related to agriculture, but we didn't, we, we didn't see yet, uh, like a sector winning the race, uh, between the others, uh, in our portfolio. So if we think about 
the top 10 companies in our portfolio. There are companies in agriculture, in food, in, in, in health, in diagnostics, in, 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 in tools, like in Euler's technologies for the biotech industry. So we didn't see yet like a, a specific, and, and our portfolio is very uh, well balanced in, in those different sectors as well. So, and then we don't particular focus on something specific. We try to balance the portfolio, but, but if we start seeing like more stuff in agriculture, more competitive, should naturally grow that, that sector in our portfolio now. And we didn't, uh, so, so far that. That's super interesting. And, and given this global market, global competition, one would expect that your companies would be mostly looked at by foreign exit, for instance, by any player around the world. My, my question is, is this the case? Are you mostly looking for exits? Is this the main motivator? Are you mostly looking for exits for companies in the US, in Europe, or do we have players here in Latin America that would be great buyers for your companies? No, I think it could be very difficult to, to, to have maybe, maybe you have some big companies, some big food companies in, in Mexico and Brazil could be some buyers of, 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 of the portfolio, no? Uh, but I think that the, the main the main market uh, it is uh, still the US and Europe. So so we have to go to that markets and, and and raise capital over there and to expose the portfolio over there. And and how about Asia? Is there let's say there's clearly has been a growing influence between the trade relationships between especially China. Uh, and multiple Latin American countries. How is that playing out? Ch the Chinese are coming fast, developing new products and new, new new technologies. They're increasing the bilateral trade relationships between multiple um, Latin American countries. Is this something that you're seeing that starts to happen to you as well, or is it still mainly for your portfolio companies? let's say Europe and, and the US, as you, as you mentioned. Yeah, or... Just as a side comment to this is that in most cases now, I think until recently, China was the most, we traded mostly with China than the US in most cases in the in letdown. So China was a bigger partner in trade. Yeah, but uh, we, have, we have some investors uh, uh, or some, some, some investments in the portfolio companies from investors from Asia, China, Singapore, uh, Japan. But, but we didn't see yet like, like, like in a specific interest from, from, uh, from Asia, uh, in our portfolio. No, I think portfolio is too, too young and too small yet. No, and maybe that could be a reason. Uh, I think uh, investors uh, in Asia uh, could be more interest in, in, interested in companies that already have a, a business running, if you focus in food and culture, rather than uh, companies that are facing, uh, they are still facing like technological risk. Uh, so we didn't see yet uh, that kind of interest. Uh, we've been in, in Korea and we have some interest from the government of Korea there, but uh, after that, we didn't see a, a real interest from the, from the market. I think that the, the, like the venture capital ecosystem in the region is very endogamic also, no, in, in Asia. Uh, so, so I think it, imagine that it's difficult for them to go abroad and to see like investments outside Asia. Uh, in the US or Europe, imagine that that could be much more difficult in 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 the in Latin America. But I think it's also that we don't represent represent yet our opportunity in terms of being suppliers of deal flow of this kind of startup for the world. No? So imagine this portfolio of 66 companies is the biggest biotech portfolio in the region is is ridiculous no it makes no sense so you're just starting at this 
you're starting. So yeah. then if we focus on exit, maybe some big gun and a big player comes in and buys whole grid X portfolio and that's how they are able to diversify the risk, huh? Wouldn't <laughs> that be the case? You know, it's like you, you build it up and then for for run one I'm open my, my LPs that I didn't mention that I have to mention because you asked me, I didn't I didn't mention. But my LPs would be very, very happy to to have that kind of offer. You have to see the price. Oh, but... of course, of course. <laughs> but it's, it's, the, it's the global invitation now coming at the table uh, to talk about Fund One of GridX because it's, at the end of the day, everybody, the LPs, they are demanding and they're going to keep you accountable, Matthias, you and your team um, on, on, on providing, yes, first that IRR, but then actual liquidation events to be able to return that capital. And, and, on, on this this term is that how do you see the exit environment? But this is like an overall topic of a whole venture venture game in Latin America. Everybody is expecting to see and demands and wants and needs desperately see more exits that unleashes more capital, more liquidity into the region because everybody outside of the region is going to be worried that is it going to be, you know, are we going to make money if we come to the region? It, 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 you know, and, and, and venture is a very risky game. You're gonna, you can choose your, you, when people are looking at their portfolio um, portfolio decisions and where do they make their allocations is like they need to be able to know with higher level of confidence that you're going to be able to get any any anything back. Um, so so well, what are you seeing? Let's say now you're fund one and now you're fund two. Is that first first of all like in biotech how long the 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 period might be that ha what have you ever seen? What are you expecting? That how long are these companies going to develop their technology um, uh, before they're going to be potentially acquired? Um, and you're yeah. able to return some money to your LPs? Yeah, no, uh, very important, that conversation. Uh, first, I have to I have to mention that the, the first crazy investors were uh, Uwe Sigman, that is a, like a very important business uh, man in, 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 in the pharmaceutical industry in the world, but in Argentina also. He lives in Spain mainly, but he's Argentinian. Uh, he was the first that said, okay, let's try with a $1 million fund I'm going to bring some friends and he brought to the table to Bago family. That is another very important pharmaceutical company. Uh, also Gador, that is another pharmaceutical company and Vicentin, that is a company doing like uh, soybean oil and a very mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. huge company in that. All were related because they were part of the Argentine chamber of biotechnology. So th they were the first that, uh, that was oh, yeah. trying to 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 to. So he, and they started this as like certain of just a wild card because they care about the content, they care about the the, the topics, and that was like okay, Matthias, okay. go and figure things out. But they're not going to hang if you if you do not. Yeah. Yes, it was more philanthropic at the first stage, uh, exactly, rather than than like uh, like speculative investments in in, in venture capital, but. It's always about money, and 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 when they put money, they ask you how is going this money. And then then so we did like a ver first pre experiment in 2017. So the 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 real first fund started in 2018. So we have like five years exposure of that first fund, and then for that second fund came out uh, another family that is called the Silegi family, the Gold family. There are important families here in, in Argentina, and also Marcos. Other uh, investors, so we uh, close with them that that first fund that was a twelve million dollar fund, the first fund. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the expectations of, about uh, returns and uh, exits, we already had a one exit, no, from from one company. Unfortunately, we can disclose uh, all the details of the of of that deal. Ah, oh, uh, too bad, too bad. Everybody, everybody needs to know this information. The world is craving for this little bit of information, Matthias. But you, no, 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 no. We'll, just, just, we'll just make okay. up the numbers. Let's I'll just pick look a number like from it, one what? to fifteen, <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> Matthias. But really? was it a good one? Did it make you smile when that you 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 got that announced, or was it like? Hmm? The exit sites. No, no, I, I, I can, I can tell you some like, like raw uh, idea of what happened. Uh, today we have like almost repaid the the, the capital on on the on on, on fund, uh, and today the 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 participation of the fund in the thirty six companies from our first fund is something like seventy million dollars. 
So uh, seventy-five million dollars, including that that, that exit. Uh, so we almost return one x, and we are uh, we have like something like six point five x in in paper uh, in five years of of, of the fund. So also returns are, are coming, and we expect that in the next five years the exposure to of, of the fund that we 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 have. Uh, to to start having conversations about the the possibilities of of exits, and the the, the main possibilities to see exit we are seeing it at the like strategic like big companies yeah. uh, acquiring in like M and A strategies, uh, and that my vision about that is uh, that we are seeing a scenario where. The companies are going to have pressure about to inform the way on how they produce in a more sustainable way. They don't have that technologies. They don't have the teams to that. So they're going to need to speed up that process of transforming themselves into uh, sustainable platforms you know, and new new practices. So they, they're going to start needing this kind of startup. They did it to digitize a lot of stuff of their, of their companies. And they, now they're gonna, they, they have to do it to transform the, the ways on, on how they produce. You know? So, so we think a, a very, very attractive M&A scenario for the next five, 10 years. Yeah. Where was the buyer from in this case? The purchase, the company that from purchased? From the U.S. Yes, from the from U.S. The US America. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yes. In Latin America, as I mentioned, I think that there are, could be candidates like in Brazil and, and, and in Mexico. Uh, companies like, I don't know, Bimbo, like uh, FEMSA uh, in Mexico, or companies like uh, uh, GBS in, 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 in Brazil, no? or, or InBev in, in Brazil as well. So there are huge companies that could be candidates, but there's no uh, like a huge critic mass of strategic buyers in, in, in the region. Yeah. But I will, in, in terms of these exits as well, is that when looking into more deeply into your portfolio uh, of GridX and looking at other biotech companies from in, in the region, one thing that it comes very evident is that the, the price tag of these companies is actually very attractive for a foreign buyer um, in a way that they have been developing very good technologies. And even though they would be life-changing for, for the founding teams, it would be very good returns for you and the early investors in the region. But in all reality, let's say if we would look at a bigger, let's say pharmaceutical or biotech company that is, has would initiate their own R&D efforts for the next six years in, in topics X, Y, Z, you can find ready-made packages where the technology readiness level is in a very high, high, high place. Uh, so this is a very important, let's say, area where there can be a very, very good deals made because you can buy these companies a lot cheaper um, because yeah. they've been able to develop their, 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 their companies with a lot less capital. Yes. Yeah. It's very simple math. Totally. And, and I think that applies to, to this, this portfolio in, in Latin America. But I think that there is a uh, not so common discussion in the, the venture capital industry uh, about the, the, the venture capital models in terms of which kind of exits we are following. No? So I think in these kind of startups, not only because they are coming from Latin America, but also because what they are doing, there will be much more possibilities to do exits between 100 and $200 million valuation. No? It's not going to be like the billion dollar company game as we've seen in the digital space yes. and and the only the outlier game of this kind of companies and winner takes all uh, strategy so i think could be more like a game of 10 companies of 100 million dollars rather than one company of 1 billion dollars no? so we're going to see less mortality less mortality and, uh, like more exits at lower lower much more lower valuation and less IPOs and less companies going to really uh, uh, replace the traditional stuff, you no? Know, as we as we've seen in the in the in the digital space, you no? Know, that today yeah. you have like the, the 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 ten 
uh, more viable companies in the in the world are like those companies that in the last thirty years came out from the ecosystem. I, I don't know if we are going to see these kind of companies in the future in in, yeah. in the deep tech space. No, yeah. or, or at least it's not going to be the business related to that. No, with the venture capital and venture, venture capital business not going to be related to that, and it's going to be more related to how we create how how we can create more hundred million dollar companies that can be acquired by these big players that need to transform them. Yeah. In in terms of critics, are you guys looking mostly for exits or more like it could happen that there's long lasting businesses that you guys want to hold mostly? No, that is depends more on the founders. Uh, our mandate is to we have we in in we are in, in the fifth year of the of the fund we have more, five more years to see what happened with the portfolio with fund one. Fund two is just one year of exposure, no? Uh, and we have some founders that you see what they are doing, what they want to do, and and you see that they want to go and and really conquer the world uh, and, and go for, for everything, no? And then you have another founders that I think that if they have a, a really attractive opportunity in, in the in in their way, it's gonna be difficult not not not, not to get it. So uh, so you have to see, and even the the founders that you're see, 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 seeing that they are more uh, ambitious about the, the the future, you have to see what happened when some like. Very attractive offers coming. Come, you world. come and say you want to be a millionaire, huh? You want to see those dollars in your bank account and make sure that your family can live for 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 a very long time. Very comfortable. yeah, you, you have like, to see. It's a tough. It will be a tough choice to make. Every you know? man has yeah. a price. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Most people do. Most people do. Hey, cool. I I would like to very as a one last topic ask, and I still go back a little bit into your model about and your approach regarding talent. Because when we look at the, the 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 traditional way of thinking, when 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 investors are looking into the founding teams, because in the early stages you're going so early, you're going just taking the biggest risk and making the biggest bets, right? It, it's absolutely nuts what you're basically trying to build from the start. But then on top of that, you're trying to make people that have never necessarily even met or known about each other to become a founding team. And in traditional speaking, in, in the venture models, is like everybody's looking very deeply into that founder relationship. How do you know each other? And 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 you know, are you a fit? It's going to be a freaking roller coaster. Is that you're trying to make somebody go like these new? What, what I haven't seen all of them. Uh, the the modern day uh, reality TV shows where you're blindly trying to put people and getting married. Right. This is what you're doing ultimately. Can we so can like, we also add to the table the biotech risk as well? Exactly, because you have no idea that like you, you can make software work, you can pivot faster, but it's a biotech. You don't even know. This is just absolutely nuts, Matthias. Which I give you all the credit and that you have the courage to do that. But let's be honest, it's nuts. So then you add even this extra level of complexity. I understand the rational that why you had to start doing this. But are you seeing, let's say, people questioning this? Well, obviously, every time you start to build something new, everybody's questioning <laughs> things out a lot, right? So, but now here is is that, like, I would be asking that if I'm looking, I've been looking at a lot of the portfolio companies of yours. I'm like, uh, I, what is happening again? Can this work? Is it, <laughs> you know? No, no. First, we, we have to talk about the motivation. So why, why are we doing this? Well, I, I just... A couple of days ago, I was looking for a document from 2014 at the beginning, and I and I find a, an email uh, that I wrote to a person that was working with me at that at that moment, and I say, okay, I talk about Redex and and I wrote to to her three things uh, I, that that I have conclusions. I, I was in an event, something about tech Trump or something, so. I came back to her and said okay, three things. The subject was three things. No? One, yeah. we don't know nothing. Second, yeah. it's going to be very difficult. Third, we have to do it. Yeah. So we really need to speed up the process on how we transform the way how we produce or transform the means of production. That's 
uh, possibility is in the scientific knowledge that it holds in the, the, the academia or the scientific system. It's not only Latin America, it's in, in the world. Now, in general, we have to speed up the process to bring more solutions to really transform the world because we are in, yeah, in a hurry right now. The next 10 years, the next 15 years are going to be like uh, very important on how we approach these necessities that, that we have in terms of transforming the way of how we produce. So we need to do it. So, and the scientific knowledge is there. So we need to, 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 to improve and to have innovative approaches to transform this scientific knowledge into real impact. We think that startups are the best way to do that, are the best uh, instrument or vehicle that humanity creates so far to transform like basic knowledge into real impact and capitalism yeah. in, in that way. So first, we, we have to do it. And this is a, co a, a big experiment of, of doing it and speeding up the way of, of doing this. Now, of course, it's, it's not the natural way to do it. The natural way is to, to create companies, to, to people know each other, they start talking, they see a problem together, and they say, okay, uh, we have to work together because we are so close and we think the same, we have the same visions and we are so compatible. Let's do this, let's, let's solve this problem or let's, let's create this. Well, if we wait for that kind of processes to create the, the amount of companies that we need to transform the way of Pebbles, it's not going to happen. So we need to, to face it different. So we, we, are, we are doing this experiment and in some terms, we didn't cross the river yet, but it's happening. It's, it's, it's great. And, and when you connect this scientific uh, researcher that's really want to impact with their knowledge, and when you connect them with a young entrepreneur that really want to impact, and they're really impact-driven entrepreneurs, they are your generation of, 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 of entrepreneurs, like, like you guys, when you connect them and, and at some point they discover that they need each other to do what they want to do in, in, in a very deep sense that is impacting the world. When they discover that and they discover that they need each other to do that and the best way to do it is together, that is very, very power, powerful. And, and that, that uh, can complement all this alternative process that we are trying to, to create that is synthetic but uh, we want to do it as natural as possible. Yeah, and then it comes ultimately then because you're, you're believing in this narrative, but others will, might not give a damn about the good cause and the good mission, right? And it's speeding up the process. Then it ultimately comes into the execution capability of the teams that you have been put together, right? And then, then um, the results are the only thing that they look at or are, they, are you seeing that people are questioning this even that the results are there? Do you see people questioning this? this, this no, no, no. And, and, and we also, our motivation is to really create something that really impact. But we are very, we have a very, very radical vision about the results that this kind of company have to put, put on, yeah. the, on the table. We, we really believe that we don't need to think about impact investing. We don't need to think about uh, impact uh, startups. We have to think about uh, startups that have different underlines, but what you see in a company is the return that that company gives to you. So we, we, what, what we think is that these companies have to be the best companies in the world in returns to their investment. So that's our, our main focus uh, and, and that's how we want to transmit to all the entrepreneurs to, 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 to think their own companies. If you don't think in terms of really big ambitions in terms of value creation, nobody's going to give you a dime or, or going to uh, uh, take care of you because you're like real impact in the world. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You, you can be in a, in a, in a, in a cool newspaper or, or podcast, but nobody's going to really take care of what you're doing if you're creating a company that really create value. 
Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Matias, for, for joining today and, and sharing a little bit about what has been happening in the world of biotech in Latin America and, and what you've been doing as a very integral part of building that world of biotech, what, what you can see today in Latin America. And uh, I, I really hope that, you know, some of your portfolio companies or the people in Latin America are going to find some of those ingredients about the biodiversity that you have in your nature, because I'm starting to lose my hair with such a speed that the current oils that I started using for the first time in my life. So now the <laughs> options are basically either I travel to Turkey and get a hair implant soon when I'm going to lose all my hair and I'm becoming bald. But I really hope that one of your portfolio companies or future portfolio companies can help on this regard as well and to find something from the nature that I can just put over here so I don't have like a sound panel over here that is going to be a bold, bold spot in my head. Because when looking at your hair, you're doing something, you know, about the and Matias. You know, this is like... I needed to, I needed to, I have more, more, more hair, but I needed to. <laughs> no, but it, at least you still have it pretty strong over there. But I'm, I'm 45. I'm, 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 I'm 45. <laughs> I'm trying to cover it up every day nowadays, you know. One well, I, can, thing, I, can, I can bet, uh, I can bet that there, there is something that's biodiversity that is going to bring us that solution. So we're going to be very, bet. very aware. <laughs> so I, I was thinking, I, I need to go and search for these. That's going to be the billion dollar exit. For sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. People are just so concerned. Even John D. Rockefeller Sr., right? The, the, the oil titan basically was having a lot of issues where it comes to his hair and he used a lot of toupees. Oh, you yeah. Know? And uh, he spent a lot of money trying to do that um, to find a better hair. One yeah. more thing, Mate, before we leave is why Gridex? What's What does the name come from? What does it mean? Gridex is like like the, the grid when... when uh, when you have different components, like uh, in in a computational uh, system, that you have like uh, unused resources distributed in in that uh, computational system, a grid is a system that can take that uh, unused uh, like uh, processing uh, potential or 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 bandwidth or, or whatever. And put it together in one, in one, uh, in, in in one system. No? So what we are doing is that we are like using like uh, dispersed resources. No, that in a separate way they can't uh, do something uh, like really powerful and putting them together to create something uh, exponential. So Super cool. That's why it's the name. Well, thanks a lot, Matias, and thanks a lot, Balti. It was a good talk, and uh, can't wait to. We can't. Oh, well, uh, I think we need to cut this last part. But <laughs> <laughs> I, so I was trying to make a good ending, but it it failed. <laughs> but uh, great to have you on the show, Matias, and I can't wait to see yeah, you in person. Nice. Okay, thanks, guys, Balti. Nice to see you.